The Lord prosper you. We wish you well in the name of the Lord. Before I can accede to your petition, we must be assured by the appointed representative of the diocese that you will be received as their duly elected bishop. We are willing and ready to do so. As president of the standing committee, I certify that David Glenn Reed was duly elected bishop of the Diocese of West Texas by the clergy and people in the diocesan council assembled on the 18th day of February, 2023. And the consents to the election have been received from a majority of the standing committees of the diocese. We therefore present to you the right Reverend Dr. David Glenn Reed to be invested for the exercise of the office to which he has been chosen. Let the will of the people here present be made known. Do you recognize and receive David as your bishop? We do. Will you do all in your power to uphold David in this ministry? We will with God's help. Let us now offer our prayers for David, for this diocese, and for all God's people. Son, Redeemer of the 
sanctifier of the faithful. Blessed and glorious Trinity, one God. Have mercy on us. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Glory For all members of your Church in their vocation and ministry, and for the congregations of West Texas, that they may worship and serve you joyfully, we pray to you, O Lord. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be filled with your love, may hunger for truth, and may thirst after righteousness, we pray to you, O Lord. For David, called to serve as Bishop of West Texas, we pray to you, O Lord. That he may faithfully follow Jesus as an apostle, shepherd, and servant, we pray to you, O Lord. That by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, he may be renewed and encouraged day by day, we pray to you, O Lord. That in the power of the Holy Spirit, he may be given grace and courage to love and serve the people entrusted to his care. We pray to you, O Lord. For Jackie and their family, that their spirits may be continually knit together in your spirit. We pray to you, O Lord. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, who moved upon the face of the waters in the beginning of creation. Church, o Lord. Holy Spirit, who blew new life into the valley of dry bones. Holy Spirit, who overshadowed Mary that she might bear the Son of God. Holy Spirit, who descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove at baptism. Spirit who appeared on the day of Pentecost as a mighty wind and tongues of fire. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
reading from the first book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord.
una lectura de la carta de San Pablo a los Efesios. Él mismo constituyó a unos como apóstoles, a otros profetas, a otros evangelistas y a otros pastores y maestros, a fin de capacitar al pueblo de Dios para la obra de servicio, para edificar el cuerpo de Cristo. De este modo, todos llegaremos a la unidad de la fe y del conocimiento del Hijo de Dios, a una humanidad perfecta que se conforme a la plena estatura de Cristo. Así, ya no seremos niños zarandeados por las olas y llevados aquí para allá por todo viento de enseñanza y por la justicia y artimañas de quienes emplean métodos engañosos. Más bien, al vivir la verdad con amor, creceremos hasta ser en todo como aquel que es la cabeza, es decir, Cristo. Por su acción, todo el cuerpo crece y se edifica en amor, sostenido y ajustado por todos los ligamentos, según la actividad propia de cada miembro. La palabra de Dios. reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. 
Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesús recorría todos los pueblos y aldeas, enseñando en las sinagogas, anunciando las buenas noticias del reino y sanando toda enfermedad y toda dolencia. Al ver las multitudes, tuvo compasión de ellas, porque estaban agobiadas y desamparadas, como ovejas sin pastor. La cosecha es abundante, pero son pocos los obreros, Dijo a sus discípulos, por tanto, pidan al Señor de la cosecha que envíe obreros a su campo. Palabra del Señor. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to start tonight by thanking St. Mark's Church, their clergy and people and their staff willingly agreed to host this diocesan service of investiture right on the very eve of Advent in this beautiful and historic church. Many thanks to Beth Knowlton, their rector, to Matt Wise and Ann Frazier, their clergy. Thank you to their incredible musicians whose music and song lift our hearts heavenward as we worship tonight. Thank you to those who planned and are hosting our reception tonight. Thank you, thank you to St. Mark's Church. 
I stand tonight in a pulpit where 10 other bishops of West Texas have stood. From Robert Woodward Barnwell Elliott, first bishop of the Missionary District of Western Texas, to James Steptoe Johnston, first bishop of the Diocese of West Texas, and up through the years to our modern day bishops who are here tonight, to James Foltz, eighth bishop of West Texas, and Gary Lillibridge, ninth bishop of West Texas, and David Reed, 10th bishop of West Texas. As I begin this episcopacy, I am keenly aware that I stand on their shoulders to build on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ, adding to the framing and joists and trusses that they laid and labored for with faith and love, with wisdom and grace, with great joy and sometimes with tears. I give thanks to God for them and for their ministry among us. On this night, I most especially ask you to join me in thanking David Reed and Patty. David is my friend and my brother, who has led us in this diocese always with great love, sharp wit, and is a good shepherd who cares deeply for his people with Patty's supportive love. New hands on to me and to us a healthy diocese. Thank you, Bishop Reed. This service of investiture is the manner in which we Episcopalians liturgically mark a transition in our Episcopal leadership. We Episcopalians love good order, and we love beauty, and we love dressing up, and we love long processions and beautiful music. I search the Holy Scriptures for stories of transitions in leadership, and there are many. Some of them are healthier than others. <laughs> One of the first is the story of Jacob, who, guided by his mother, tricked his aging father into giving him a blessing instead of to his brother Esau. This is one of those not so healthy transitions. And then there's the story of Moses asking for God's guidance in whom to endorse as his successor. And God led him to Joshua, with whom he had served and worked for many years. Moses dies in sight of the promised land, while Joshua leads the people across the Jordan River. And there's the story of Naomi mentoring her widowed daughter-in-law, Ruth, and of Ruth's great devotion to her mother-in-law. And in the New Testament, we find Paul writing letters to a young Timothy, whom he was raising up in congregational leadership, and whom he clearly loved. But I believe the biblical text, which most clearly speaks to the transition we are making here in West Texas tonight, is that of the prophet Elijah bestowing the mantle of leadership on Elisha. The parallel to our transition is rather amazing. It's similar not because Bishop Reed, like Elijah, could run faster than chariots, <laughs> and Elisha had to work really hard to keep him in sight. And it's similar to our transition not because Bishop Reed, like Elijah, is about to be caught up in a fiery chariot pulled by fiery horses, though that would be a quite dramatic retirement exit. <laughs> Today's transition is uncannily similar because Elisha and Elijah pretty much have the same name. <laughs> Which makes me wonder that when the average Israelite called on the school of the prophets, did the receptionist have to ask, which Elijah do you want? <laughs> the one with the J or the one with the SH? the original Elijah or the new Elisha. And when Elisha followed a few days after Elijah into a town, did people say, you're Elijah? 
you look different. Did you get a haircut or something? <laughs> David Reed may not be quite the same as Elijah, and I'm certainly no Elisha. But I do pray for a double portion of David's spirit to fall upon me as we make this transition. In just a few weeks, we will enter and begin our sesquicentennial year, our 150th year in the history of our diocese. It is the beginning of a new chapter, a new decade in our life and ministry together. And it will bring with it some unique challenges and some unique opportunities. We enter the next decade of our Christian life facing some challenges that are very different from those faced by the church in the last century. We have emerged from the COVID pandemic, even though we're still fighting it quite often, and our eyes are more open to some new realities in which we do ministry. We are living and ministering in what seems to be a limbo time. It feels like we are in between, a time between what the church was as we knew it and a time of what the church will be that has not yet been revealed to us. In this limbo time, we also face unique challenges in our culture. We live in a rapidly changing post-Christian culture. Unlike the last century, we cannot assume that people will be Christianized just because they live in America or because they live in Texas. We cannot assume that they will learn to follow Jesus by living in this country. The majority of young adults today did not grow up attending Sunday school or in a youth group or going to camp or regular attendance in worship. And it's not those young people's fault because their parents didn't grow up that way either. We cannot assume that the average person on the street has much working knowledge or any relationship with the person of Jesus Christ or knows even an outline of the biblical story. In addition, much has been written lately about changing patterns in worship attendance and in church membership. According to Jim Davis and Michael Graham, we are in the middle of the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country. During the last 25 years or so, about 15% of Americans living today who attended church have stopped. And COVID seems to have sped up that trend. As you know, we are also entering the presidential election year in a deeply divided America. Our political divisions and our dysfunctional political leadership have led to an increasingly lack of tolerance for people who differ from us or who hold different opinions. And those divisions constantly threaten to enter our congregations and divide us along political lines. Christian nationalism is on the rise. And one result of those trends is that there is a low level of trust for institutions in America, including the church. You and I and our congregations experience the impact of all of these trends weekly. Many of our churches recognize that some of the ministries and programs that they used to do are not as effective as they once were. Some of what used to work does not seem to work anymore. Many have struggled to rebuild rosters of lay ministries after COVID and have seen changes in the presence of children and youth in their church. In this limbo time, we are experiencing rapidly changing culture, technological evolution, changes in worship patterns, deep political division in a post-Christian culture. These are strange times in which we live. And as we enter this new chapter in our diocese in life, we don't have a crystal ball to tell us exactly what the future holds. We are entering a wilderness time, and we don't have a satellite map to show us all of the terrain. And I, as your bishop, do not have the answers to all of our questions. So what do we do? Many years ago, a young man grew up in a wealthy household it was a time when his country was embroiled in foreign wars, a time of massive cultural change, 
the time between when the divide between rich and poor seemed to be growing wider. The young man wrestled with his own family's wealth. He wrestled with a failed attempt to join the military for the sake of glory. And he wrestled with the presence of the poor in his own community. The young man's name was Giovanni, but most people called him Francesco or Francis because his mother was French. Francis often prayed in a decayed and fallen down chapel named after St. Damien in the town of Assisi. And one day as Francis prayed, Jesus spoke to him from a crucifix hanging on the wall, saying to him in so many words, Francis, rebuild my church. Francis took Jesus' call to rebuild the church literally and began rebuilding St. Damien's church. He reused some stone and then went around collecting stones from all over the community, reused beams, fashioned some new ones, begged for funds, and finally, with much sweat and toil and some help from friends, the little church of St. Damien's was rebuilt. And Francis may have thought Jesus' call to restore the church was completed, but Francis would think, was thinking way too small. For within a few years, Francis and later a young woman named Claire had formed a new religious order following Jesus Christ. They did not stay in the little church of San Damiano. Francis led a growing movement of Christians who denounced all wealth and followed Jesus not into seclusion, but into the world, preaching, teaching, healing, sharing, serving the poorest and the sickest and the most on the fringe of society, worshiping all along the way. Those Franciscans spread the good news of Jesus Christ to all creation and reached hundreds of thousands of people. Francis' call was not to rebuild a building, but to join God in God's work of restoring all people to God in and through Jesus Christ. As we enter this limbo time of what the church was in the last century and what the church will be in the near future, it seems to me that we can take some lessons from St. Francis. Our church, our diocese, is certainly not crumbling ruins like St. Damien's. We are far from that. We are a healthy diocese. In many, many ways, I see so many of our congregations doing transforming ministry in their communities. But here's a lesson I think we can take. When St. Francis rebuilt St. Damien's church, he didn't just reuse what was already there. He used some of the original stone and some of the original structure, but then he went out and got new stones and new beams and new trusses. And the result was a church that had both some original materials, but also much that was new and different. As we enter the decade ahead, we must do the same. We must hold on to our Christian and Anglican heritage while also building anew, because much of what used to work is not working as well. We're going to have to learn and experiment and do research and development. We must let the Holy Spirit who moved over the waters in the beginning of creation move over us and through our congregations and not stifle it, but let the Spirit open our eyes and ears to new forms of doing ministry, fresh expressions of gracefully engaging our neighbors with the good news of Jesus' love for them. We must save the roots of our Christian and Anglican heritage, but we also must experiment and be incubators of the new. We must try new ways of planting churches, learning languages, launching ministries, building relationships in our communities, revisioning budgets, worshiping our Lord, incorporating the arts, loving our neighbors, and serving the poor and the immigrant and the outcast. We must venture into the fringes and wild places of the uncharted territories of our culture and bring the light of the gospel with us. We must learn from church planters and college ministers who are already serving on the frontier of these relational ministries. For one thing is certain, we can no longer wait inside our beautiful and comfortable church buildings 
and expect people to find their way to us. Like Francis, we must get outside of our walls, in our church offices, and into the neighborhoods around us, joining Jesus in his mission of reconciling the world to himself. We must go out there where the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. Some of our experiments will be highly successful, and some of them will fail utterly. I imagine Francis had some great days when he was rebuilding St. Damien's Chapel, when he stabilized a wall or installed new windows. And I imagine he had other days when he hit his thumb with a hammer or dropped a big stone on his big toe. But experiment and try we must, even when we stub our toes, because sitting around is not an option. This will be hard work. It is challenging work in a challenging time, but it is holy work. It is the work of the gospel. We cannot do it alone. I cannot do it alone. But God has given me, you, the beautiful clergy and people and congregations of West Texas, a good foundation of faith on which to build our future, and most importantly, God has given us his Son and sent us his Holy Spirit, and that is more than we need. Because as we undertake this work, there are a couple of things I know for sure. I know that the gospel of Jesus Christ rises far above all of the political divisions of our time that threaten us, far above any political party or candidate, for we are united in Christ in deeper ways than in any political affiliation. I know that there's also plenty of research on how many unchurched and formerly churched people are simply waiting for an invitation from us to return. I know that in Christ, old dogs and even old Episcopalians can learn new tricks, that by him and with him and in him, things which are cast down are being raised up and things which are grown old can be made new. I know that in Christ, mountains can move and seas can part and prophets can run faster than chariots. That through Christ, lepers are healed and outcasts restored. The blind can see again and the poor have good news preached to them. And people in a rut can be born again. And yes, I know and you know that in Christ, the dead can be resurrected. So let us undertake this holy, restorative, experimental work. Let us enter this new chapter together with hope and optimism and open to the Spirit. For we are the church in West Texas, a multicultural movement of missional people following Jesus out into neighborhoods near and far. Jesus promises to be with us to the close of the age and tells us that even the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Amen. Amen. My brother, it has pleased God to call you to be the shepherd and chief pastor of this diocese. I am sure that long before now, you have laid to heart the high trust and weighty obligation of this office. But in order that this congregation may know your commitment to fulfill this trust, I call upon you to reaffirm the promises you made when you were ordained and consecrated to this Will you exercise your ministry in obedience to Christ? Will you obey Christ and live the word of him? Will you be faithful in prayer and in the study of Holy Scriptures so that you may have the mind of Christ? I will, for he is my God. Will you boldly proclaim and interpret the gospel of Christ, enlightening the minds and stirring up the conscience of your people? 
power of the Spirit. As chief priest and pastor, will you encourage and support all baptized people in their gifts and ministries? Nourish them from the riches of God's grace. Pray for them without ceasing and celebrate with them the sacraments of our redemption. I will in the name of Christ, the shepherd and the bishop of our soul. Will you guard the faith, unity, and discipline of the church? I will, the love of God. Will you share with your fellow bishops in the government of the whole church? Will you sustain your fellow presbyters and take counsel with them? Will you guide and strengthen the deacons and all others who minister in the church? I will, by the grace given me. Will you be merciful to all, show compassion to the poor and strangers, and defend those who have no helper? I will, for the sake of Jesus Christ. May the Lord, who has given you the will to do these things, give you the grace and power to perform them. Amen. My brother, you have been recognized as a bishop of the church and as bishop of this diocese. Now I, David Mitchell, read by the authority committed to me, and with the consent of those who have chosen you, do invest you, David Glenn Reed, as bishop of West Texas, with all the temporal and spiritual rights and responsibilities that pertain to that office, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And on behalf of the people and clergy of the Diocese of West Texas, I give into your hand this pastoral staff. May Christ the Good Shepherd uphold you and sustain you as you carry it in his name. Amen. May be seated. It is my pleasure to welcome you to St. Mark's this evening. Whether you are joining us here in person or you've joined us online, please know of our warm welcome. Let me add my thanks to our staff and our volunteers, to the diocesan staff, our wonderful musicians under the direction of John Johnson. You're about to enjoy the wonders of our kitchen as well. Uh, which means I hope you will stay following this service for a wonderful festive reception. To get to the parish hall, you just need to exit out this way, go to the right, go down the stairs, go to the left, and you'll be welcomed warmly there. That's where the bishops will be ready to receive you. We give you great thanks for this. We will be collecting an offering in the next few minutes, and I encourage you to give generously to it. It will go to the bishop's discretionary fund for his good use, and we look forward to you doing that as well. Again, our wonderful welcome to each one of you. We're so glad you're with us, and we ask your blessing upon all of us who are gathered, and especially upon Bishop Reed, and we give thanks for all those who have made this day possible. The Lord 
be with you. Let us pray. Righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thy with us. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Jesus Christ, by your death you took away the sting of death. Grant to us your servants, so to follow in faith where you have led the way, that we may at length fall asleep peacefully in you, and wake up in your likeness for your tender mercy's sake. Holy God, the source of all good desires, all right judgments, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, so that our minds may be fixed on the doing of your will, and that we, being delivered from the fear of all enemies, may live in peace and quietness, through the mercies of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our companion in the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope that we may know you as you were revealed in Scripture and the breaking of bread. Grant this for the sake of your love.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting on us this world the knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. 